As doctoral students studying higher education and the law at Texas A&M Commerce, we are providing in this video a review of the key dimensions of faculty rights. Higher education history has been evolving, it would seem, since its inception. Whether the evolution involves acknowledging students who are demanding better meals in the cafeteria or assisting professors who feel that they were wrongfully terminated, the response to concerns in the academic setting is important to these continuous changes and modifications. The protection of university students, staff, and faculty while incorporating proper procedures that ensure a fair outcome is paramount in the success of higher education institutions. Dismissals in higher education can be initiated by academic cause, which includes denial of tenure, academic misconduct in teaching or research or incompetence, as well as disciplinary misconduct, which includes misuse of funds, institutional or grant related, insubordination, immorality, embezzlement, neglect of duty, lack of collegiality or harassment, unprofessional conduct or other good and just cause, as well as reduction in force, which are layoffs in times of financial hardship, loss of program funding, or reconfigurations. Due process protection occurs in public colleges under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments in the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the Fourteenth Amendment in Section 1 extends due process to the state government and therefore to public universities and colleges. In private colleges, due process is governed by good faith adherence to handbooks and contracts. Due process means that legal proceedings must be conducted with fairness in procedures and in content. There are two elements of due process that the courts must consider for public institutions in higher education. And the first is, does due process apply? Or are liberty and property interests implicated? The second is the level or the amount of due process that the court case depends on. Liberty interests may include damage to a person's good name, reputation, integrity, or honor that would harm their ability to find employment or make money. Property interests are related to employment contracts and the person's claim to salary and benefits. Two cases that should be considered here are the Board of Regents of State College v. Roth in 1972, and in this case it was found to have not violated the faculty member's due process rights because he was non-tenured and his contract had expired and no charges were made against him that might have damaged his good name or his ability to find employment. However, in Perry v. Sinderman in 1972, the college was found to have violated the faculty member's due process when, after 10 years of one-year con one contracts, his contract was non-renewed without a hearing. A property right was established with entitlement to continued employment unless cause for dismissal could have been de demonstrated. The level or the amount of due process depends on three criteria. One, the severity or the loss of deprivation to the employee. Two, the type of dismissal. Discipline dismissals are formal. Academic dismissals are less formal and fall under academic abstention, which is the differential treatment to decision makers in higher education and contract termination, which is detailed and formal. Three, the balancing of rights of faculty and staff versus the interests of the college. Faculty and staff dismissal procedures must follow institutional policies, and these policies should include, one, a notice of rule violations with opportunities to make corrections and annual reviews of employee performance, two, a notice of charges or reasons for dismissal, three, notification of decisions to be made, and four, a hearing with a third-party decision maker who is fair and impartial with a right to appeal. However, institutions of higher education have alternatives to termination. Their policies may include progressive discipline. In other words, there may be consequences that increase in severity with successive infractions. Um, options may be written or verbal reprimand, reassignment, restitution, denial of merit raises, demotion of rank or salary, or suspension of pay or benefits. 
In addition to due process, faculty rights also include collective bargaining, which is defined as a negotiation process between employers and employee representatives to deal with grievances, wages and benefits, working conditions, and other conditions of employment, and generally employees select their bargaining representatives through unions or associations. In the private sector, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, or Wagner Act, allowed collective bargaining through formation of unions or organizations and established the National Labor Relations Board. The Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 and the Landrum-Griffin Act in 1959 amended the NLRA by defining who fell under their authority, allowing injunctions against management and union activities that were prohibited, and set requirements of governance of unions. In the public sector, collective bargaining is subject to state law and not regulated by NLRA. Thirty-four states require collective bargaining, and in these states, they set requirements for the bargaining representatives and identify areas that require bargaining, are prohibited from bargaining, or areas that may involve bargaining with mutual agreement. However, there are three states, including Texas, that prohibit collective bargaining. Federal employees were authorized the right to form unions and collective bargaining when President Kennedy signed the executive order in 1962. Currently, there is not a National Right to Work Act. However, 23 states have this as law, including Texas. The act states that individuals may not be denied employment because of membership or non-membership in labor organizations. How do you think a National Right to Work Act might impact collective bargaining? The law itself has been introduced repeatedly over the years, but never signed into law. Collective bargaining began in colleges and universities in the late 1960s. However, in 1980, with the National Labor Relations Board versus Yeshiva University, private faculty were classified as managerial and exempt from participating in negotiations because faculty were involved in self-governance, tenure decisions, and other economic decisions. And this caused ex existing faculty unions to dissolve. However, in 2000, the NLRB determined that in most cases, faculty members were only advisory in the decision-making process. There are three groups of employees who may be more active in collective bargaining in the near future, and these include graduate students who established their first union in 1969 at the University of Wisconsin, as well as adjunct faculty whose rights are somewhat limited as part-time employees. However, there are collective bargaining um, that does exist in places such as New York University. Um, a third group that may be more active is online faculty um, because they have issues of workload and compensation like number of courses faculty can teach, number of students in each course, time required to prep and work online, and ownership of course content. In addition to due process and collective bargaining, personnel records are an issue to be considered under faculty rights. Personnel records are defined as records that help document the employment history of an individual, but they're not limited to higher education. These records may be paper, electronic, audio, or video, and examples may include college transcripts, evaluations or promotions, such as annual reviews, or tenure files, um, application materials, resumes or vitas, disciplinary informa information, or notices of infractions. Traditionally, these have been considered the property of employers. However, employees consider them to be private and confidential and that they are only accessed or managed by supervisors. However, as public employees, transparency is an issue to the public. According to the United States Constitution, there are two kinds of privacy. Informational privacy is the federal government's release of private information about individuals, and constitutional autonomy regards the federal government's interference with highly private individual decisions. Many state constitutions also have explicit guarantees of privacy, and all states have adopted one or more of the following common law tort claims in regards to individual rights to privacy. 1. Intrusion on seclusion. 2. Public, public disclosure of a private fact. 3. Being placed in a false light publicly. and 4. Appropriation of another person's name or image. The public's right to know versus the employee's right to privacy is a major issue in personnel records. 
The Privacy Act of 1974, or Freedom of Information Act, now a part of FERPA, allows for the general public to request that the government disclose records unless they are subject to a specific exemption. By 1983, all states had adopted state-level Freedom of Information Acts. However, a number of states have no exemption language in these acts. Therefore, disclosure of personnel files is subject to case-by-case -case analysis. In the University of Pennsylvania versus EEOC in 1990, the case emphasized that the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has the power to enforce its statutory duty to investigate discrimination. In this case, university officials had to release confidential male faculty peer review materials to the EEOC for evaluation of the female applicant's claim of discrimination in her application for tenure. In summary, protecting the rights and the records of individuals by state and federal institutions occupies a significant responsibility in ensuring a fair process. And today the students, staff, and faculty have benefited from the struggles, court hearings, and lessons learned from the individuals that came before us and established the rights and order on our campuses. The key to success of public and private institutions lies in our ability to ensure that records are protected that there is a due process available, and that collective bargaining remains part of the equation in higher education. We hope you found this information beneficial, and in conclusion, we would like to give reference to the following informational sources.